This is the Alps' most imposing open-air arena. And it's made of coral. An ancient world of breathtaking beauty, home to a primeval, pristine animal kingdom. It mirrors the Earth's history and evolution. A strange garden that still inspires flights of the imagination. For centuries, these were simply the Pale Mountains. Today, they're a wildlife paradise and everyone knows their name. An arena for heroes and pioneers. A world heritage site in northern Italy. Coasting on the wind, the King of the Alps surveys his kingdom. The eagle's hunt was successful. Predators have no shortage of prey here. Golden eagles rarely carry more than five kilos to their high eyries. He'll return to this fox carcass over the next few days, unless another predator snatches it away. The Dolomites extend over 16,000 square kilometers. Barren, rocky deserts to dense alpine forests with plenty of space for the fellow predators of the golden eagle. Wolves once again roam the forests. Wolves are found wherever there are deer. But healthy adult deer are rarely a target. Wolves would rather prey on the weak, the sick, or those isolated from the herd. the deer know he's watching. It's a delicate ecological balance. Culling the weak evenly across his range, the wolf maintains the strength and health of the stock. The deer are not terrified. This is not the big bad wolf of old. In South Tyrol, the wilderness is bordered by vineyards, a perfect spot for a connoisseur. The fox is a Dolomite native, as the leaves change colour, his pelt provides perfect camouflage. A short time of ease before the onset of winter, and the fox is a real fruit lover. The Dolomites are an encyclopedia of Earth's geological history. Water, sun and ice compressed fossils, coastlines and coral reefs into rock giants. 250 million years ago, the Earth's only continent split and the sea took over. Over millions more years, coral mountains were formed. 
their underwater valleys filled with sediment and lava flows. This tumultuous process left its mark in the colors of the rock monuments, in gardens landscaped by fire and water. Alpine chuffs are a type of small crow. They shelter in the craggy walls of the legendary peaks. Their Latin name, Flaming Speaker, says it all. Alpine chuffs are real chatterboxes. These colony dwellers use their songs for courtship and to determine rank. Once established, a pair will develop its own individual calls. Flocks are biggest in the autumn months, as young and old search for food together. Alpine chuffs are fine with humans. They are found wherever people have moved into the mountains. More visitors means more food. A chuff has only two reasons for being alone. A hidden stash of food or a spot of rigorous personal grooming. Mountain passes are highways for wildlife. The lynx is Europe's largest wildcat. It will only claim a territory next to another lynx. In the southern Alps, a 500 kilometer gap separates the Swiss and Carpathian lynx populations. The Dolomites are in the gap. Around 120 lynx currently live in the Alps. Many have been registered and tagged. B132 was recently seen here. He wandered to the Dolomites from Switzerland via Trentino and now lives in the Brenta Massif. The larch is the Dolomite's signature tree. Stands of these hardy pioneers can hold out against sudden blasts of freezing cold and heavy snow. As the rock giants freeze, life heads down to the valleys and the shelter of nutrient-rich forests. The ibex is a type of goat that usually lives between the forest and the glacier line. Molting season is all about scratching and scraping. And they know exactly which areas can't be reached with horns. Grooming is a sign of affection, but it's not the breeding season yet as the doe's response makes crystal clear. That doesn't stop the competition from leaving scent markers. The ibex doesn't just smell, he tastes what's in the air. The herd's strongest buck is kept on his toes. The battle is intense, but in the winter season, its outcome changes nothing. Rank has already been determined and won't change until next year. Ibexes are master energy savers. Winter is all about not rocking the boat. A small stretch can save a long walk.
In winter, even the Golden Eagle's food supply is limited. Open ground is covered in snow, and any creature that still braves these conditions has been especially well equipped by nature. The rock ptarmigan is perfectly adapted to life above the tree line. Unlike other plant eaters, it even finds nourishment in the woody stalks of dwarf shrubs. A relic of the Ice Age, it lives wherever it's cold. It can dig itself a snowbed in a matter of seconds. It's perfectly content at heights over 2,000 meters. The more snow, the better. Feathered feet carry it across the snow. The ptarmigan changes plumage up to four times a year and is always well camouflaged from predators roaming overhead. Thermal imaging reveals another hidden talent, perhaps the most important for these conquerors of ice and snow. Air pockets between the feathers are nature's way of ensuring perfect heat insulation. Ptarmigans are genetically predisposed to withstand the cold. Even at rest, heat loss is radically reduced. An energy saver at work. When asleep, their coloring makes them practically invisible. Crossing the Dolomites in winter is especially challenging. But waiting till spring isn't an option if you're looking for a new territory. Just a few years ago, a visitor from Slovenia moved to the Dolomites. He was fitted with a tracking device that made it possible to identify Slauko and follow his travels over several months. After many detours, he met a she-wolf from the Apennines, and together they founded their own pack north of Vicenza. Hunting and the density of Europe's human population have made the wolf a creature that's active mainly at dusk and at night. A lonely wolf in search of new territory doesn't exactly fit the stereotype of the rampaging beast. Without the help of technology, he'd be almost impossible to find. Thermal imaging shows a wolf approaching a dead deer. The fresh fawn is a welcome find, but the wolf holds back. Wolves are cautious and can spend hours circling an unexpected food source, assessing the situation. Before domesticating the wolf, prehistoric hunters most likely learned from such hunting strategies. To survive icy two to three thousand meter peaks, you have to be adaptable. The fox, the wolf's distant cousin, can always rely on his sense of smell, 450 times better than ours. He can effortlessly sniff out a mouse, even in deep snow. But 
When the marmots are in hibernation and the snow slows him down, a fox, with his eye-catching coat, is particularly vulnerable in daylight hours. Hunger can make him forget the constant threat from above. Flying may look elegant, but it takes a lot of strength. Golden eagles can only hunt in the right thermal conditions, and when the prey isn't too heavy. That's why alpine hares are a particularly welcome target. If only they weren't so well camouflaged. In winter, the hares gather in large groups. There are no individual relationships and no clear social order. Alpine hares are mating aces, and that takes precedence over everything else. Under those circumstances, living in small social groups would only lead to competition. They just seek out the best feeding areas and then build proper snow burrows for shelter. They'll couple again even before they've given birth in spring. Thanks to a biological peculiarity known as superfetation, they can produce a number of litters during the short summer season. The longer the winter, the more humans and animals are pushed together. The fox tries his luck at a villas, a typical Ladin farmhouse. The scent of a winter chicken coop is hard to resist. A kilo of chicken equals 50 field mice, enough food for two days. But the chickens are safely housed and the fox has to move on. When crossing steep inclines, a shifting snow slab can be a wild animal's downfall. But for plant eaters like the chamois, it can reveal a few morsels hidden beneath the snow. During the winter months, this hoofed animal's metabolism is set to an absolute minimum. The young have already learned the trick from their mothers. Snowfalls of up to eight meters make Dolomite mountain pastures impossible to reach. Foxes head into the valleys, closer to human settlements. Well-stocked granaries attract their favorite prey, mice. Sometimes things are surprisingly easy. The red fox is a good climber, hunting like a cat. Foxes are all about jumping straight in. He'll catch 15 to 20 mice a day. His skill and adaptability make him the Alps' most successful predator.
deepest winter is the golden eagle's mating season. Sixty pairs of eagles now live in the Dolomites. Each pair has its own territory. Their number of offspring depends on the availability of food. Initially, golden eagles leave the territory of their youth, but at breeding age, they often return to familiar terrain. This ensures that golden eagles are a stable population in the heartland of the Southern Alps. These distinctive rock formations have long been the inspiration for sagas and legends. They stand like the ruins of a city of giants and dwarfs. And their heroes are mirrored in the alpine wildlife. At around 2,000 meters, amongst upland moors and dwarf shrub heathlands, is the traditional mating arena of the Black Knights, alpine grouse. Freezing cold is their element. They leave the shelter of the forest in the dawn light. Over a period of weeks, they will joust for the favor of their hens. Their oversized windpipes produce a mating cry that can be heard far and wide. Showing off is part of the game. The black knights are polygamous, real machos. Nest building and caring for the young is not their thing. The Ladin are the Dolomites' oldest human settlers. In Ladin legend, here at the Falzarigo Pass, a king was turned to stone for betraying the mythical people of the Farnes. The remains of a chamois fawn attract a passerby. Wolves weren't always part of the alpine fauna. After an absence of almost 200 years, they returned to the Italian Alps about 20 years ago, not far from Turin. A vigorous protection program now aims to help them re-establish themselves. Wolves reach sexual maturity at the age of two. A young she-wolf from Slauko's pack may have found a mate. Not exactly love at first sight, but their tails are down. No one wants to fight over the territory. Sharing may be a challenge, but that doesn't mean a total lack of interest. And there's time before the winter mating season sets in. Wolves have highly developed social skills. They are careful not to injure each other in the tussle. Threatening and submissive gestures are sufficient to clarify the relationship. There's enough for them both. <laughs> Wolves 
With a growing deer and chamois population, maybe wolves can make a permanent return to the Alps. If we can forget the fairy tales of the big bad wolf. Successful wolf reintroduction means local human inhabitants have to accept them first. In Europe, most wolves still die at the hands of humans. Dinner for two is still a long way from a stable relationship. Whether they build a new pack over the coming years depends on their success at claiming and keeping a large enough territory. Biodiversity in the Dolomites depends on extremes summer warmth and winter frost, sunny meadows and dark gorges, eroding rock faces with extreme height variations over a small area. It's a delicate ecosystem, like the sensitive organisms of a living coral reef. It can only sustain itself under the right conditions. That's true for big vertebrates, and for colorful little blossom hoppers. Climate change is forcing flowering plants to ever higher altitudes. The butterflies follow, but higher up the environmental niches for these little heroes become fewer. And that's true for bigger heroes, like wood grouse. In summer, nature reaches its full splendor. Time for a proper bath. This young brown bear, still with his white scruff, makes the most of the opportunity. And he's not alone. Brown bears have grabbed more headlines in the Dolomites than any other animal. In the space of 10 years, 34 litters numbering 64 cubs have been confirmed here. During their first year, cubs are particularly dependent on their mother. If she's lost in an accident or shot, the summer will be fraught with many dangers. Seasons change quickly in the Dolomites. In its wanderings, the newly established wolf pack must constantly secure its territory. It's essential that enough prey is available and direct contact with humans is avoided. Abandoned ruins from the First World War come in handy. Former trenches become animal trails. A hundred years ago, the Dolomites were the scene of bloody battles between Italy and Austria. Traces of this mountain war can be found everywhere. The size of a wolf's territory depends on the amount of prey available. European wolf territories range from 150 to 300 square kilometers. Wolves are inherently shy creatures. The Progetto Lupo, an in-depth state-run project, was set up to observe and analyze wolf behavior, to understand how humans and wolves could cohabit. Motherless bear cubs have little chance of survival. One case recently made the media. Near Cortina Tampezzo, 
a mother bear was killed during an attempted capture. To save her young, local government set aside land for the orphaned cubs and agreed to cover all the costs. The scent of forest ants attracts the bears, but they don't yet understand what an anthill has to offer or how to get at it. Their mother would have gone straight for the protein-rich ant eggs. But without her example, the first assault ends in failure. And the ants manage to drag their eggs to safety. But in the abundance of the forests, the bear cubs don't need to rely on treats like this to survive. Mixed forests have made a comeback in the Dolomites. A combination of deciduous and coniferous trees promotes a rich bird life. The tree creeper makes his way up a trunk. Specially shaped claws and supporting tail feathers help him on the climb. Perfecting the nest with a long splinter of wood is an unexpectedly difficult challenge. He gets there in the end. High above in the swaying treetops is new life. The buzzard is happiest in a nest at the edge of the forest, where he has a clear view. The adult birds feed their young for over a month. Soon this nestling will take flight. But the tree creeper's brood isn't ready yet. He keeps running to the top of the tree. It's getting cramped in the buzzard's nest but the fledgling still hasn't found the courage to leave. Once upon a time, the Rose Garden of Laurin, the Dwarf King, covered these mountainsides. The legend was inspired by the pale dolomite stone, reflecting the last rays of daylight in rich shades of pink. Unhappily in love with a princess and betrayed by his knights, Laurin turned the roses to stone so that they couldn't be seen by day or by night. But the Dwarf King forgot about the twilight hours. This is when the wolves are most active. The she-wolf from the south joins in the defense of what may yet be their shared territory. Each leaves invisible scent markers on grass and rocks. It's an important part of their communication, along with body language and calling. Landscapes have so much beauty to reveal, even after sunset. Wolves howl for many reasons. Here, it's about making contact and flushing out any rivals from the territory. 
it has nothing to do with the light of the moon, another myth that refuses to die. The warmth of the day rises from the valleys, shrouding the ancient pines. Many myths and legends draw their inspiration from the twilight hours or from the silent creatures of the night. The lynx isn't yet established in the Dolomites. Even though the landscape suits it perfectly, Europe's biggest wildcat only claims a territory when another lynx is already close by. With vision six times better than ours, it sees the night sky in a whole new light. In the morning, the drifting clouds in the valleys seem to echo the Milky Way. One of these mountain ranges is called La Temar, the Milky Sea. This strange stepped landscape is known as the Marmot Parliament. Ladin legend links these rocks and the skies. Their national saga, the Fanis, shows the cycle of life itself as an interplay of contrasts. Rock and sky, man and woman, hunter and gatherer, embodied by the eagle and the marmot. Over millions of years, the seabed rose again and again, settling in striking folds. In Ladin legend, the marmot was in the beginning, its bond to Mother Earth made it leader of the animal kingdom, representing peace and security. At the Marmot Parliament, the small rodents enjoy the brief summer. Lacking sweat glands, they cool their bellies on smooth rocks. Free grooming sessions included. is the second Ladin totem, symbolizing pride and power. In the Dolomites, the golden eagle rules the skies. Soon, this young eagle will be ready to find a mate. The white wing markings, a remnant of adolescence, have almost disappeared. With a wingspan of almost two meters, the golden eagle impresses more than just the marmot. In the legend, marmot and golden eagle go into battle together to protect their land. But in nature, the marmot is the eagle's favorite prey. uses his wingtips like hands to steady himself. Today, things are busy on the limestone flanks of the Marmot Parliament. The rodents live in family colonies of around 20 animals. Two generations can share an extensive underground burrow with sleeping chambers, escape tunnels, and even toilet areas. For marmots, cleanliness is all. The golden eagle hunts over open terrain. Researchers discovered only recently that he too has his hunting strategies. He spots potential prey from afar. This young fawn is in grave danger. One false step and the eagle will swoop.
The chamois herd takes cover in the mountain crevices. The eagle circles away and re-emerges from the cover of rocks and shadow to launch an attack at close range. This tactic isn't always successful. The chamois have found a safe refuge and are beyond the reach of the king of the skies. The Dolomites region has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2009. Slavko, the Slovenian wolf with the tracking device, once covered a distance of 570 kilometers in two months. But Little Red Riding Hood has nothing to fear. Wolves prefer to remain in the isolation of the forest. The evil wolf that decimates entire herds is a myth. Wild, romantic meadows are havens of peace and the starting point for many a mountain adventure. Each alpine pasture is overlooked by a dramatic vertical challenge. The Dolomites attract humans for one special reason. This 1930s documentary was recently rediscovered. Mountain fever is contagious. Over the last hundred years, Europe's mountaineering elite scaled every Dolomite rock face. They may have been inspired by their mascot, the chamois, but these human heroes went far higher. Because the chamois themselves have no ambitions to reach the summit. For them, summer is about rest and looking after the young. and it all takes practice, preferably under their mother's watchful eye. Long legs and strong hooves are good on scree, and even more useful when it comes to getting a swig of milk. Young chamois are wolves' perfect prey. If only they weren't so high up and so well looked after. The bear cubs love to cross the road at hairpin bends without looking. They've managed well on their own, maybe by finding a carcass in the forest or raiding another animal's store. Alpine pastures offer plenty of food in summer, and they've shown they can look after themselves. But playing without an experienced mother's protection can be fatal. Bear cubs aren't used to traffic. Four-wheel drive metal bears don't trigger a flight response. Climbing is part of playing too. Bear cubs also use this skill to get a vantage point for their fine sense of smell. Far more sensitive than their vision. Mm. 
Constant contact with cultivated land has broken down boundaries with humans. This can be dangerous for all concerned. These bears won't return to the wilderness of their own accord. They'll only survive if they're looked after by humans. Many alpine farmers have become landscape gardeners. They are given unused fields to turn into habitats for marmots that prefer meadows with short grass. One final tussle over rank. The alpha couple must confirm its position before hibernation. It's time to bring in dried grasses for the start of winter, for their burrows, and maybe even for the Fanes people. According to legend, they're still hoping for salvation under the protection of the marmots. The grass will be used for insulation and to line the sleeping areas and nurseries. There's a good reason why humans feel an affinity to marmots. Haymaking and stocking up for winter are a strong uniting element. It's not Laurian the Dwarf King we should thank for the dense forest of the Dolomites. They're the work of the spotted nutcracker, once unfairly persecuted as a seed thief. Today, we recognize him as a gravity-defying forest landscaper, dropping pine seeds high up at the very edge of the tree line. The young ibexes are now going head to head. Fowls are allowed. The horn is a versatile tool. Pressure from wolves forced ibexes to move higher up the mountain sites. Over time, they adapted to ever steeper, safer terrain. Almost 200 years after wolves disappeared from the Southern Alps, this young pair may be about to found a new pack. It hasn't happened yet. For now, wolves are still guests in the Dolomites, though they have established themselves in the neighboring regions. By scent marking, they're claiming the territory and also confirming their own relationship. They may have a future in the Dolomites. If humans continue to give them the space they need. The Golden Eagle has that space. Its realm stretches from the far foothills of the Dolomites to the Campanile di Val Montanaia, the monument in stone that marks the start of the descent to the Venetian plain. The Alps' last wild river, the Tagliamento, weaves 170 kilometers to the Adriatic. 
her landscape a vast shifting network of tributaries, gravel banks and islands. Great white egrets take over from the eagles as sovereigns of the skies, as the taliamento tirelessly bears shingle and silt from the rugged garden of the Dolomites to the Mediterranean south. Here the cycle ends. The majestic rocks of the pale mountains, formed millions of years ago from the remains of living oceans, return to the sea as grains of golden sand. <laughs>